I personally feel that the globalization movement was one of the great success stories of recent years politically. I came to the realization that you know, what we were essentially doing at that movement was we were fighting a, a planetary bureaucracy. While people talked about free trade as this kind of spontaneous phenomena having something to do with the internet perhaps and globalization as being the sort of almost natural force of nature kind of thing, uniting people, facing borders, this is the rhetoric of the 90s. Now, what we found when we looked at, at what actually happened was that, you know, what was really a uh, innovation, um, borders weren't being effaced at all. You know, if, if globalization is the free movement of people, products and ideas, well, products and capital were moving around, uh, but people and ideas were not, um, in fact, much less so. And what was really happening is they were setting up um, the world's first real planetary bureaucracy. We'd had the UN and institutions like that, um, but they didn't really have any teeth. Whereas things like the IMF, the World Bank, the, the institutions that were being highlighted uh, by the uh, protesters at Seattle and Washington, all these institutions um, really did form an effective administrative web, um, which was capable of imposing its will almost anywhere. Uh, and we came to realize that mm, there's these trade organizations, and then there are these transnational corporations, there's these international financial institutions, and, and finally NGOs. And they form this kind of a web whereby you know, policy decisions, if you're in Nepal or, or Tanzania, simply aren't being made locally at all anymore. Um, no one really talked about it as a bureaucratic structure because somehow it was all supposed to be discussed under the rubric of globalization and free trade. And I came to realize that the theme of bureaucracy is a really important one that no one really talks about anymore. Uh, I did a Google Ngram search, you know, those things where you can look at um, the number of times a word appears as a percentage of all words in all books over time. And if you look at bureaucracy, it sort of goes up and up and up and up until about 1973 or 4 peaks and then it just goes straight down. So people stop talking about bureaucracy. On on the other hand, if you feed in a word like performance review, additional documentation required, you know, everyone just went straight up like that. So the amount of actual paperwork and bureaucracy that uh, fills our lives is increasing you know, apparently exponentially. So, and, and I thought that this is a real political problem as well because you know, the right at least has a critique of bureaucracy. It's a very bad critique, but it exists. And it's this very simplistic market versus state sort of thing. Sort of 19, goes back to 19th century liberalism and the line is simply that, well, you know, government imposes all these insane, stupid regulations that stifle individual initiative. You need to unleash the market. And when I did a little research on, on, on this, I discovered that any market reform that intends to reduce red tape and bureaucracy will, in fact, produce more regulations, more paperwork, and more bureaucrats than existed before. Uh, I've tested this on a number of cases, I believe is always the case. Essentially, we now have a situation where public and private bureaucracies have fused together so thoroughly that you, they can no longer be told apart. The um, example I always give is a bank. I was on um, the phone not long ago with my bank in America. I spent about an hour and a half, classic bureaucratic runaround. One person sent me to another. I had to re-enter data 25 times. It kept getting lost. I got sent numbers that didn't exist and um, so forth and so on. Um, I realized if you talk to a bank official about this sort of thing, every now and then I've complained, they always say the same thing. It's, well, there's all these government regulations, you know, which is true. But then if you look at how the government regulations happen, essentially the banks write the regulations. They give, you know, bribe money to the politicians. Uh, they call it campaign contributions. So they bribe the politicians or lobbyist shop and say, here's how we'd like to be regulated. They do a little bit of negotiation, tweak it around a little bit, and pass it as law. So, so if you have these banks who are like regulated by systems which they kind of half create, I mean, is that a public bureaucracy or is it a private one? I'm, you can't tell anymore. And that over and over again, there's this confusion. And I also realized that the profits from capitalism nowadays are essentially derived from this fusion of public and private bureaucracies increasingly. And what they call finance. Of course, finance is really just other people's debts. It's really about collusion between government and private interests to create mass indebtedness. So you can see this with uh, the craze for certification, which is also a classic feature of bureaucratization. You, you know, uh, insist that more and more professions, you need various types of degrees, and then to finance the degrees, you, um, it's usually the people who are profiting off the financing of the degrees who actually um, push through the legislation.
you could say that the, the real driver of capitalist accumulation right now is actually utopianism uh, in the classic sense of the term. I mean, bad utopianism. The, the, the usual critique of, say, the Soviet Union or sort of state socialism is, well, you know, they tried to force human beings into a shape they wouldn't go. They had this idealized idea of how people should behave. They set up rules based on that. And then when people wouldn't behave that way, instead of saying there's something wrong with our rules, they said there's something wrong with the people, and they punished them. Um, but, uh, you know, you think about it, that's actually the driving force of capitalist accumulation right now. And, and I'll give you an example of J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, in 2009, 71% of their profits came from fees and penalties. So basically, they're making money off of making up rules that you can't follow. And when that happens, saying, no, the problem isn't with the rules. The problem is with you and punishing you. That's it. That's classic utopianism. So this is how capitalism now works. It has very little to do with production um, and, and, and commerce, at least in terms of the profits. Um, it comes from this sort of bureaucratic fusion of, of, of public and private, where you can't tell anymore which is which. There was a kind of a collusion that you could see it starting to happen in the 70s between the upper echelons of corporate bureaucracies that used to be oriented toward actually making stuff, which kind of aligned with the financial sector, which they used to be fairly hostile to, and whereas the financial sector itself became increasingly corporatized. Um, so this new class um, sort of uh, set off on various directions. A lot of what happened with technology, for example, it would be hard to understand except in the light of that realignment. Um, suddenly there was a sort of massive shift away from the sort of space age technologies that everybody was talking about in the 60s um, toward information, medical, and military technologies. I always like the line that, you know, the American Apollo moon landing was the greatest historical success of Soviet communism. They never would have done that had it not been for the Soviet Union. And once those guys were no longer really a technological threat, they sort of shifted. So there was a, a, a huge shift toward information technology. I'm old enough, I actually remember the 70s when computers were the, you know, were kind of a joke. Whenever something went wrong, everybody's like, oh, uh, let me guess, the bank had some computer, right? And, and now we've got to the part, point where the only part of our infrastructure that always works are ATM machines. I think this is incredibly symbolically important. It never gives you the wrong amount of money, right? So it gives you this idea that fin finance is the only thing that's really real. Uh, the only thing, you know, the, the, the escalators don't work, the trains don't work, you know, the infrastructure doesn't work, but the money always works. And the final aspect of this is the idea of paperwork as value. I really think the ultimate idea that they're trying to spread in many subtle ways through all of this is that it's actually paperwork that produces value. You know, this goes from every level to uh, where being poor is now a full-time job because all you have to do is paperwork proving that you're worthy. But as you go up to the echelons, you know, like, like what is like financialization really? It's, what is a securitized derivative? I mean, it's really re just really, really elaborate paperwork. The most valuable things are these forms assessing the value of things. The question is, how can we break through this? And I think the global justice movement was a great example because it was the first great global anti-bureaucratic movement, even though it came late to the realization that that's what it was. So after 2011, sort of wave of, of revolutionary movements that swept the world in 2011 can be seen as the second coming of, of the global justice movement and the principles that it developed. And those are principles of direct democracy and direct action above all. You know, you need to expose the existence of these giant bureaucratic institutions you aren't supposed to think no exist. Um, so the idea of, of those movements was to pose a directly de democratic alternative, to essentially demonstrate to people that we have accepted a bureaucratized view of existence without realizing it. Um, you know, people who live in societies that consider themselves democratic don't actually practice democracy, have no experience practicing democracy, and don't really know what it would be like to do so. We're all taught in a thousand subtle ways through this sort of uh, infusion of bureauc bureaucratic principles in our lives that democracy wouldn't be possible, and um, don't even realize this is happening. But if you try to demonstrate that real democracy would be possible logically, you just couldn't. On the other hand, if you show people, it has an amazing effect, uh, because it immediately opens up horizons. If you s people sit down and say, wait, 80 people can sit in a room, or 1,000 people can sit in a courtyard, or uh, park and, you know, make a collective decision with no leadership structure, wow, you know, all my life I, I've been taught to believe that was impossible.
uh, we, we are in an interesting situation where the political structures which um, we are used to referring to as democracies are for the most part things created to suppress what the people at the, who created them thought of as democracy. I mean, when I try to annoy Americans, my mom, um, I always point out nowhere in the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution does it say anything about America being a democracy. There's a reason for that. The people who created the Constitution hated democracy and said so all the time. Polls always show the same thing, that everybody loves democracy, um, hates politicians, and is kind of dubious about the very idea of government. But think about it, like if democracy means electing politicians to run the government, how could that possibly be true? Uh, clearly, democracy must mean something else to people. They're just not quite sure what it is. When the thing runs amok, it, it becomes self-reproducing. And it seems to be what we have now is in a political system which has essentially become, for the last 30 or 40 years, a war on the imagina human imagination. You know, we talked about that sort of ruling class freakout that happened in the late 60s and early 70s about the prospect of, of unchecked uh, technological advance really affected the consciousness of politics from then on. That you know, the people running things in real positions of power either were in college in the 60s or were kids in the 60s were at an impressionable age, um, absorbed this. Almost everything about the way the go governments um, and systems have been set up under their ages, consciously or unconsciously, has been designed to prevent that from ever happening again. By constantly narrowing political horizons, it's partly because the existing system can increasingly not justify itself by its own merits. You know, traditionally the major arguments for capitalist system were that while it, you know, might create great inequality, the general prospects of even the poorest are constantly going up. So people can expect to be richer than their, and more secure than their parents. Well, clearly that isn't true anymore. Um, so the major argument is that nothing else could ac actually be possible. And this has happened on all fronts. I mean, it, it's happened on all fronts to the degree to which I actually believe this of, of what's called neoliberalism, the real ideology of the last, um, since the 70s, uh, that has accompanied this financialization. Neoliberalism is really about prioritizing the political over the economic. It presents itself as exactly the opposite, right? But, but in fact, um, you know, it's about, you know, if you have two choices, one which will make the current economic arrangements seem like the only possible economic arrangement, and another one which will make current economic arrangements actually be more viable over the long term. You always choose the former. You know, you always go for the ideology over the actual practical effect. Um, as a result of which, you know, we have a system that's increasingly falling apart in front of us, but nobody can imagine anything else. Um, but ultimately, I think this is a revolutionary process um, that uh, the, the creation of forms of, of of democracy has become a revolutionary act for this very reason. You know, people talk about Occupy Wall Street, what happened to it? I was there for about eight months in New York right after the evictions from the park, and we tried every conceivable way of setting up a public space, and they just changed the laws constantly. Essentially, the First Amendment, when it comes to the freedom of public assembly, has been repealed in the U.S., I mean, which is an amazing panic reaction to a bunch of guys just sitting around in a park. Um, it just shows just how threatening this is. And in those spaces, um, the other thing which I think was um, everybody who was in them found truly remarkable was that he had the time to talk. And you know, suddenly here we had these people who could like, like actually hash out a problem for as long as it took, even if it took two days. You know, no one was stopping them. The topic of debt came up over and over again. Um, because debt, you know, strikes a very fundamental idea about what people basically owe each other. Money is really just promises that people make to one another. How do we reimagine that? You know, what kind of promises would free people ask one another in a free society? Um, a politician say, well, we promise you free education. We promise you this. We promise you that. And they get elected and say, well, that was unrealistic. The government owes all this money. They're saying, like, you know, a promise that we make to bondholders is sacred. A promise we make to the public well, come on. <laughs> I mean, that's just made to be broken. And if you, if you challenge people on that, right, what are they going to say? They'll say well, say, well, of course that makes sense because, I mean, if you break your promises to bondholders, if, if, if you, people who lend money and they won't get the money back, well, they won't be as willing to lend and, and then, you know, the economy will suffer, right? Yeah, but if politicians constantly break their promises to voters, people will be less willing to vote and the democracy will suffer.
one thing we realize is that we're going to have to start by completely reimagining what people owe each other and starting about the, thinking about the nature of money is a really important way to do that. The Bank of England uh, a year and a half ago actually wrote a report admitting that heterodox economics is right and that the entire you know, philosophical basis of austerity, there's only so much money, uh, is, is, is not true. Um, money is actually created by banks when they make loans. Um, no politician has apparently, as far as I know, acknowledged this. Or, um, so, so you have a complete disparity between you know, the way politicians talk about money and the way that the people actually running the system are talking about money. It's total opposite now. So you know, the first thing I think social movements have to do um, is to create a viable economy is just to like, talk about the way these things actually work. And you know, think about debt just as a matter of, like, as a society, we make promises to each other. We make a promise how much we're going to grow next year. We make a promise uh, how much more we're going to produce uh, than we did last year. And a lot of what debt is is as growth rates go down, we keep promising ourselves to create more and more ecological results of which, as we all know, were catastrophic. Um, insofar as it will be possible to create a viable economy that won't destroy the planet, we're going to have to think very seriously about what it is we consider to be valuable in work to begin with. Um, so, you know, when I meet people at parties, I would often say, oh, I'm an anthropologist, what do you do? And they'll say, well, you know, actually, I'm the senior East Coast vision manager for this. Uh, I mean, we write reports and then have meetings and give them to other people who have meetings about the reports. A huge percent of the workforce, I thought, you know, 20, 30 percent, were sitting there every day thinking, I'm not actually doing anything. I hope nobody figures it out. I mean, how could you have dignity in labor if you personally believe your job shouldn't really exist? Factory work has gone down precipitously, even if you count China, India, and places where it's still going on a lot. Um, it's not nearly as much a percentage of the population as it used to be. You know, people think it's all been replaced by service work, but actually domestic service largely disappeared. So the total amount of service work hasn't gone all that much. But administrative and clerical work is like, you know, quadrupled. The whole sector has gone from 25 to 75% if you include service of the economy. And, and these are all those guys sitting in the office say, hoping nobody figures out they're not doing anything. How is it? Especially, you know, you can see how in the Soviet system they're making up jobs to keep everybody working or looking like they're working because they have a full employment ideology. Capitalism is supposed to be the opposite. A capital a private firm should not be hiring people who don't do anything. You know, in the 19th century, social movements are actually quite successful in inculcating a labor theory of value. That, and it was an industrial-based you know, labor theory of value. It took the factory work as a sort of primary idea of work. It had enormous social effects, but it was very flawed because it was very androcentric. It had to do this ideal of productive male factory labor as this kind of paradigm for all work. And as a result, it was kind of easy to attack. So that suddenly you have this counteroffensive in the 20th century, where this idea is replaced by the notion that really productivity comes from the brains of entrepreneurs, and you're just a bunch of robots you know, sort of carrying out their commands. Um, so then the question became how to validate work. So they really pushed this originally Puritan idea that work is just valuable in itself. It doesn't have to produce anything. So in a perverse way, the uselessness of the work actually became a virtue. Um, because anything that made the work fulfilling sort of undercut that disciplinary um, role of work. So, and, and this is the way people think nowadays. You know, if there's any way somebody would get any pleasure or um, fulfillment out of a job, they think they don't have to pay them or there should be some way that they can get them to do it for free, right? Um, you know, real work is work that's meaningless. You know, that's how you have these corporations that don't feel they have to pay people to do art or translation or, you know, anything that you might do because you actually have some interest in the subject, but are willing to shell out all this money on corporate lawyers and strategic vision coordinators. And I think that the only way to shift this is we really need to move toward a new idea of what is valuable in labor. So during Occupy Wall Street, we had this web page called the We Are the 99% web page where people could, um, you know, talk about their sit life situation and why they supported the occupations. You know, 80% of them were women and even the men were almost always in caring professions. But they all had the same complaint. I want to do a job which actually where I care for other people and benefit them in some way. But if you want to do that, they'll pay you so little that you're in such debt you can't take care of your own family. So I think we are at the brink of a reformulation of what work is and what is valuable about it that could really lead to a reformulation of how we organize everything. You know, I think debt cancellation would be a really good start uh, to break us of the idea that debt is a sort of absolute moral obligation. Some idea of basic income is really useful in, in, in separating the idea of labor and, and compensation. Um, because ultimately, I think that markets 
such as we have now are not rational ways of allocating labor at all. They just make people work more and more whether there's anything to do or not. People are now complaining at the prospect that robots will replace work. I think if there's ever a sign that an economy is stupidly organized, that would be it. Like, oh no, we're going to have, nobody's going to have to do work anymore. What a disaster. You know, we often look at these problems as technical problems, and I've been intentionally avoiding laying out blueprints and um, models for how a utopian society might work. You know, uh, and one reason for that is that technologies tend to follow. Once you sort of set out in a direction pursuing a set of principles, then the technologies that you wouldn't have expected emerge around that. You need to think about how to unleash popular creativity, and that's why I emphasize democracy. The way to start is not to come up with a model, but to come up with a means by which people can actually decide for themselves what sort of economy they'd like to live in. You know, we act as if there's a, ideas are scarce on this. This is not a natural way to think. This is a result of a 30-year campaign against the imagination to convince us that uh, people are not basically imaginative or ideas are not out there. I would say there's nobody on earth right now who could not think of at least one idea of how to solve a common problem that plagues us that none of us could have thought of, right? Now, why is it we're not hearing those things from them? Well, because, you know, 99.9 .9 of them spend most of their lives being told to shut up all the time. <laughs> and we need to figure out how to create mechanisms to stop doing that. Uh, and, and, and once we do, I think the rest will take care of itself. <laughs>